Now let me give the floor to Ling Long to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Jun. Uh, it's my great honor uh, to introduce uh, the keynote speaker, um, Professor Douglas Bates today. And uh, I also want to give a little bit uh, a spoiler. And uh, Professor Douglas Space, also the uh, uh, award receiver of our 2023 ASA Statistical Computing and the Graphic Award. And congratulations. Um, Dr. Um, uh, Bates is currently an uh, emeritus professor in the Department of Statistics at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. He received his PhD in statistics from Queen's University at Kingston in 1978. After being on the Faculty of Mathematics at the University of Alberta, which is where I am now, uh, he joined the University of Wisconsin Medicine in 1980, where he chaired the department from 1991 to 1994. Throughout his career, he has published two books and over 40 papers. He has served on the editorial board of the CM Journal of Scientific and uh, Statistical Computing from 1983 to 1984, the American Statistician uh, 1989, um, Journal of Computational and Graphic Statistics 1990 to 1993, and uh, the current index to statistics 1998 to 2003. He became a fellow of uh, ASA in 1992. Uh, Dog Base has contributed significantly to the development of S and R language since early days. I think most of us benefit a lot from this. Uh, he is a founding member of the R development core team. Besides, he is well known for his impressive contribution to the development and the implementation of uh, mixed effects model. And uh, I have been playing this mixed effect model, this package for many, many, many times, spent a lot of time on it. I really appreciate it. He's one of the major developers of the three widely used package for mixed effect model NLME for S and R, uh, LME4 for R, and the mixed models for uh, Julia. Um, there are a lot of uh, uh, contributions. Uh, I'm not going to mention all of them from Dr. Bates. Uh, we, without further ado, I will turn the floor to uh, Dr. Bates. Thank you. Um, is the audio okay? All right. Um, well, as the first speaker today, um, I want to start relatively slowly. Uh, also, as uh, you can tell a lot of my contributions were back in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. And uh, that means that I may not be entirely up to date on everything that's uh, going on in the uh, statistical computing world right now. So if things get a little slow, I'll just talk about the history of some of this sort, uh, some of these ideas. Uh, let me tr start to try to share my screen here. <clears throat> and uh, is are the slides visible there? Yes. June? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So, <clears throat> one of the great uh, advantages of doing uh, the uh, statistical computing at present is that there's so many choices and there's so many high quality choices. So um, some of you may be familiar with uh, Charles Dickens book, Tale of Two Cities and the first paragraph saying it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And so the good news here, and you'll see this in the next session, that there are several powerful and well-supported languages and environment for, environments for data science. So uh, that's a wonderful aspect of that. Uh, you have a multitude of choices. The bad news is that you need to learn how to use these different tools. And they'll have slightly 
similar but slightly different function names. The syntax will be different. The support tools will be different. And you need to spend a lot of time transferring. And it's also the case that you end up with crosstalk in there. Uh, I remember in high school sitting there staring at an assignment one day trying to decide this is right, but it doesn't look right. And finally realizing that I was trying to put a Latin ending on the end of a French verb and it didn't fit. And so some of the time you can start to think about, oh, here's what this call is, but then you try to implement it and it says, no, no, no I don't know that argument. And you realize that you're trying to use an argument from Python on an R call or something along those lines. So what I want to talk about today, and it, it's fairly simple, again, I'm trying to do this on a gentle introduction, is some of the tools that I've found that can apply to multiple languages, and they can help reduce this crosstalk and the cognitive load that's uh, imposed by having to remember several different but similar ideas and, and methodologies. Uh, I should point out that at the bottom of the slide, there's the uh, a URL for where you can go and see the, uh, the documents that I'm going to be talking about today. So um, let me go into a little bit more detail today. I'm going to talk about three different uh, tools like this. One is the arrow binary storage format for data tables. And the point of arrow is that it's cross um, cross platform and it's cross languages. So if you were to look at the um, the link here, it's to the Apache arrow uh, website. And uh, as I say, if things get slow, I'll tell you some history, such as where the term Apache came from. And uh, at, at one point, uh, Jun Yan studied in our department. And, and uh, I remember that uh, one of his contemporaries was talking to me for several months about a page. And I couldn't figure out what in the world a page was, and it turned out that it was Apache. So um, here, it's you know they say here that it's a language independent, columnar memory format for flat and hierarchical data, and in our case that just means tables, and columnar just refers to the fact that it's uh, columns. The elements in columns are adjacent. It's column major. Uh, as opposed to a lot of database systems, which can be uh, row major. And the flat data just refers to having a table. Um, and it's, uh, it's cross-platform and, and says a language independent system in here. Uh, the next that I wish to talk about is uh, the Corto document preparation system. And many of you may know that our studio has now become posit.co. And at some point in today's presentation, I will inevitably say POSIX when I mean POSIT. So if I say that, just sort of allow it to go through. Um, POSIX is the specification for a Unix-like operating system, the system calls in it. And I keep saying that when I mean POSIX. Um, and I also want to talk a little bit about the VS Code editor and the extensions that it provides in there. So as was mentioned, I started working uh, with S in the 1980s when it was under development. When R came along in the 1990s, uh, I shifted my development efforts to R. So from the 1990s and on, um, I've been a member of R Core since I think 1997, but you should realize that I'm no longer active in the development of R. They just sort of keep me on the masthead out of courtesy, I guess. 
As a result, I know base R pretty well, but I'm not a tall of tidyverse expert. I had some experience with Python in the 1990s and in the early 2000s, but that was primarily for website development. It was mentioned that I was involved with the uh, current index to statistics. And when we went to a, a website for that, um, we used uh, uh, Python and a system called SOAP. Starting about, two th about a, a decade ago, 2012 or so, um, I got interested in this language, Julia, and have primarily been working in Julia for the last decade. So uh, I have experience in these languages, but not a lot of experience with Python. And I don't have a lot of recent experience with uh, R. So let me first of all, just go to uh, some of the write-ups that I wanna talk about. And uh, these are at a, a website called bmbates.corto.pub. And um, I want to express my thanks to the good folks at Posit for providing corto.pub which is incredibly easy to use. Uh, these slides are there, and I'm going to go to here. Uh, this is what that site that I just mentioned, dmbates.corto.pub. And I wanna talk about this uh, document here, which is just some notes on reading and saving the crash data. So the next session is going to be what's described as a data jamboree, talk about the, um, the data set and uh, have experts from uh, Julia, from Python and from R uh, discussing some of the aspects of that. The uh, data itself is available as a CSV file. Um, this, by the way, is that VS Code editor that I mentioned. And if we look at the data, which is... So it's just a CSV file. It gives the date, it gives the time, uh, the boroughs information on the zip code, the latitude, longitude, et cetera. And oftentimes our uh, analyses start this way. And uh, for many people, they're always going to go back to the original CSV file. Um, I have advocated more taking the human readable form and transforming it into something which is machine readable. And this is where I find the arrow format to be very, very useful. I want to do some minor validations and rearrangement of the data. I want to raise some other questions about the data, and then I want to store it in arrow format. And there's three ways that I'm going to do this. I'm going to read it first in Julia and write it into arrow and then read it in both Python and R. I'm going to then repeat this operation, but reading it into R and reading it into Python first and then creating that. So this is the sense in which it's cross-platform and cross-language in that you can take the information from any of these languages and in fact, several other languages, including C, C++, Rust, um, uh, Ruby, you know, there's, there's a lot of them. If you go back to the, uh, to the uh, Arrow website, you'll see that. And then, um, I, you can see how it's accessible from the different languages. Um, I shall tell you ahead of time that it is not a complete success. And we run into a few uh, glitches along the way. So I want you to know that, that you know, this is all under development. So this is uh, using this Corto language, if you check, um, there is a uh, GitHub repository. And let me, let me 
bring that up. So it's github.com. Um, slash DM Bates slash ASA. Oops. Uh, let me try that again. So you can clone this repository. Really? I thought that I had more in there. Um, well, we have the opportunity to show you some of the Git integration in VS Code. Aha, I, I committed, but I forgot to push. Um, so there, you can check there that these are the slides that I was talking about. And this is the uh, crash data. So it looks, for those of you that are familiar, this looks very much like a R markdown or a knitter file. And that's because the people who developed Corto are the people who developed R markdown and uh, knitter. So you can just go ahead and um, follow along and, and this provides you with the information on that. Let me, nope, don't want to go there. Reading and saving. So there is, there, this is just a code block in Julia instead of uh, saying library or require the way that it's done in in R, or instead of saying uh, import, uh, there's a directive in Julia called using. So the arrow package is designed to read and write the arrow format, and the CSV file, a CSV package, uh, reading and writing CSV files. Data frames is a separate package in Julia, and dates and date times are also a separate package. So this is the file uh, that I showed you a moment ago. I'm gonna read it as a CSV file and convert it to a data frame. Um, there's a few optional arguments, named arguments that I'm going to include in here to uh, create small versions of uh, uh, integer values to normalize the names, which in this case means replacing the blanks in the column names with underscores so that it's easier to type them. Um, and the string type, I'm going to cause it to be strings. Once I get them in, I'm going to change the date, which is in the form of a um, character string of the form month, day, year into a date object. And this is the result. Uh, let me make this a bit smaller for a moment. So the, uh, the description of this data frame is that the first the first row is the, our first column is the date. And it has now, because it's been converted to a date object, the type is date. It now writes the date in the ISO format where it's uh, year first, then month, then date. So that when you sort these lexicographically, they're sorted uh, chronologically as well. We can see here that the uh, dates are all in the correct month, which I presume is because June selected them to be in that month. We also have uh, the times, which have been converted to a time. And the uh, earliest time is at midnight. And the latest time is at 11.59 PM. Uh, the median time is about 1.30 in the afternoon. Here we have a set of uh, uh, burrows, um, but nearly a third of those are missing values. Mm -hmm. And the 
Um, the zip codes, zip codes look reasonable. Most of the zip codes in in the uh, in New York City are in the range of somewhere around ten thousand. But again, the same zip codes are the same number of zip codes are missing as are the um, boroughs. So my guess is that the zip code information came first, and then the borough was derived from the zip code. I didn't check to make sure that the same ones are missing, but it seems highly likely. This is the uh, latitude, and there's obviously missing uh, values here that should be missing. Uh, zero latitude means it's on the equator and no part of New York City is on the equator. Similarly, zero longitude means that it's on the prime meridian and there's no part of New York City that's on the prime meridian. Um, so these location, uh, one of the things that's a little interesting here is that you can see there's um, the maximum longitude, the maximum latitude was 0 0.909206. This one's just printed as 0 0.9092. I think that this has just been rounded, but it's not stored as a rounded number. The numbers are the same. Uh, across streets, the number of people. Uh, if you're wondering what does downcast mean, it's the fact that these run in the range between zero and eight. And so they can be stored as an eight bit integer. And now there's the different characteristics of what was the contributing factor. Um, these are, I think, pre-programmed uh, options in here. And this is a, um, a collision ID the, the uh, value is sorted by, or the rows are sorted by collision ID, but the collision IDs, although they're blocked according to the day, uh, within the day, they're not in chronological order. And there's, there's skipped values in there, so I'm not sure exactly what that means. These information about the different kinds of vehicle type codes is more free form. And that's always a challenge. If you, if you look at the possible values, you'll see that there's about seven or eight different ways that fire truck gets written. So it's, uh, yeah. Many people when they're filling in data entry, view it as a creative writing exercise and that can be a bit of a challenge. So anyway, we see that the crash dates are in the correct month. There's no missing values. Uh, we see that there are no missing values in the crash times. There are 117 values of exactly midnight. Um, is this a matter of bad luck or is this people didn't fill it in? One of the things that is always a challenge for us is trying to distinguish what people decide to put in when they don't know the value and the missing value code. Um, there's 178 unique non-missing zip code values, and that's stated in the Jamboree description. Uh, in the strategic arms limitation talks, President Ronald Reagan, and this is the only time that you'll hear me quote Ronald Reagan, is uh, stated that you should trust but verify. Later on, I found out that that's a Russian uh, saying. And uh, when people tell you things about the data, just accept it, yes, that's very nice, and then go and check. <laughs> so that's the trust but verify. For example, is there really a zip code of 10,000 in New York? I think there is, but it would be good to check. Uh, the values of zero for the latitude and longitude, these are obviously incorrect. Uh, they should be coded as missing. Uh, another question is, should we keep around the location in addition to the latitude and longitude? Um, I don't think that there is a value in keeping location separately from the latitude and longitude. I believe that you can reconstruct everything in the location from that. So I would omit that. 
As I said, the collision ID is unique and it can be used as a key. So in database terminology, a relational database refer to a primary key as being a unique non-missing value and frequently a numeric value so that you can use that to index a table. Number of columns seem reasonable. A further consistency check is suggested in the Jamboree tasks. You'll see that in a moment. Um, in the contributing factor columns, again, look at all the possible values. There's a unspecified occurs a lot. Is that systematically different from missing? Or is unspecified just another way of saying missing? So this is another cleanup task, is trying to decide should I use this in this way, or do I just go ahead and keep them separate? And as I said, uh, vehicle type code is freeform data entry. And so you have unk, unk, unknown, unknown, and all of these things that are probably the equivalent of missing. It is possible that there could be a difference because if you had a two car collision, then there aren't values for vehicle type three, four, and five. So those are gen legitimately missing. It could be that something left the, um, the scene of the accident and it was involved, but you don't know. So there's, there's questions like this that always end up going, if, if necessary, going back and checking with the, um, with the originators of the data. Um, the codes in the contributing factor uh, columns seem to be standardized. Uh, one thing that struck me was why is illness with a single S uh, one of the options? If they're standardized, shouldn't that have an additional S in the end? So I want to address just a few of these issues. Uh, the way that a column is extracted from a data frame is with this dot extractor or one of the ways that it could be extracted. And then this is just a pair notation saying change zero to point zero into a missing value. And there's a convention in Julia that you can work on the uh, vector in place or an object in place. And if you're going to mutate an argument to a function, the name of the function, you usually append an exclamation point to it. It's not a, it doesn't have any semantic meaning. It's just a convenience and it's just to indicate to the users, oh yeah, this would be a good idea to check these arguments because one or more of these arguments could be mutated. It could be uh, modified in this call to the function. Similarly here, we're selecting on the whole data frame saying drop the location or give me all the columns except for the location. And we can go back and do the description there. So now we can take the arrow function and we can write that to a, um, to a, a binary file, the arrow file, right? And it just says, okay, I wrote this file. And it's a binary format. The columns that are show, stored as, are shown as strings are stored in what's known as a dictionary encoding. If you're familiar with the idea of a factor in R, which just has a, a small collection of levels and then a large collection of indices into that vector of levels. Uh, that's the general concept of dictionary encoding which is used in, in the other system. So you can see here that the original uh, data file was 1.4 megabytes. Uh, the binary system is down to 583 kilobytes. It isn't important to, uh, it isn't as important to make it small. Uh, you can also apply various kinds of compression to the columns of the files when you write it and that's automatically detected and changed when, it, when it's read. And you can add metadata key value strings like a description of the table, a URL for a lot downloading the source and so forth. But the important thing here is that it can be read 
And even if it's very, very large, it can be read very quickly. Um, it takes advantage of what's known as memory mapping. So you can work with very large files in this case. And the reading is essentially instantaneous. If we do bring it back in, we say we're gonna create a table. It says, okay, here's the various values. And um, again, we have the dates and the times and all of that. Uh, we could take this table, we could convert it to a data frame, we could convert it to another type of data. So now I'm gonna go into R rather than in Julia. And I'm going to use the arrow package in R and call the function, which is called read feather. So the history is that before the arrow format was created, there was another uh, disk file format, which was called feather. And arrow was kind of a more general version of the feather format. For some reason, the people who created Arrow decided to name the format as Arrow, but then they also said, oh, this is the Feather version too. So when you're looking at some of these uh, systems that are based on the C, C++ form that is in, uh, in the uh, arrow uh, repository, it will refer to read feather rather than read arrow, even though this is the feather version two, which is the arrow format. Anyway, you can go ahead and you can read it directly into R and you will find, okay, now I've got a data frame in R. I believe in fact, it's a tibble and you can, take a look at that and you'll see here that we have the dates and uh, they're the dates that we put out. Here the time has been converted to an hour, minute, second and I'm not entirely sure how I convert that back to the conventional um, way of looking at it as, as uh, two digit hour colon two digit uh, minute colon two digit second. The borough is a factor, the zip code and, and all of these kinds of things. So this has brought an R uh, version of the data frame uh, without having to go through a lot of contortions. It just says, oh, I understand what the Apache arrow format is like there. Um, and looking at this, tells me that maybe I should have converted the date and the time to being a date time instead of before saving the arrow file. If I look at Python, um, there is a package in Python called PyArrow. And again, to read these, you look at, I'm not sure if it's called a sub package or a sub module, but uh, PyArrow.feather. So if I bring in, if I import that and I ask it to read the table, this is to me the, uh, the best way of summarizing these data. Um, or at least I always use this version when I wanna see, okay, what exactly do I have in this file? I particularly like this way of writing it out. So it says, okay, we're gonna get a pi arrow table. The crash date is a date stored in 32 bits and the resolution is to the day and not null. What does that mean? It means that there's no missing values in that column. So this is the way that a schema is often described in a relational database system. This is now a 64 bit uh, time value, which has nanosecond resolution uh, which is kind of overkill in this case, but nonetheless, it is um, a useful, it, it's, we, we know that it's being interpreted as a time. The borough is going to be stored using this dictionary encoding. So there's a set of potential values, and then there's a set of indices into that value. 
This one doesn't say not null. So in the double negative sense, it does allow for missing values in there. If it doesn't allow for missing values, it will explicitly say not null. And similarly here, we have the zip code, the uh, longitude and the latitude. These could probably be stored as 32-bit floats rather than 64 bits. And all of this information. Then it follows it by telling you that here's a sample of the dates. And we just want to verify. OK, so we started off with January the 1st, 2022. And uh, these are the crash times were uh, 705 was the first one. That's not the earliest crash. We can see over here that there's one which was at 430. So as I said, within the day, these are not in chronological order, but they do correspond to the values that I saw when I uh, read the um, information here that the first one was at 705. Wow. I thought that that was set up as 007. Anyway, uh, so um, now this is an interesting one. The borough is set up, as I said, a dictionary, and the dictionary has the values Queens, Brooklyn, Bronx, Manhattan, Staten Island. Uh, this is a little complicated to read. The dash dash dictionary colon refers to this line, this, the next line, and then the dash dash indices colon refers to the line afterwards. So these are sort of out of place, the indicator of the dictionary and the indices. But notice that there are no values, missing values in the indices, and there are also no values in the dictionary. Uh, we'll see that if we read it in into Python, the native Python format would not have this null in the dictionary. So the convention in Python, if I have something like a factor or dictionary encoding, is that I and it allows for missing values. The missing values are in the indices. They're not in the set of potential values. The convention in Julia is the other way around. The missing values are part of the dictionary, and then the indices are all valid indices for that dictionary. And it's just a, a different approach. Um, Julia tends to be much more concerned with types, and as a result, um, it, it works that way. Anyway, suggestions for a second round of data cleaning. I could combine the crash date, the crash time into a single column. I could re-express the contributing factors uh, as a separate table, or I could express them as a dictionary uh, column or something along those lines. But the reason that I don't want to keep these around as being separate all the time is that I'm wasting a lot of space. It's conventional for many people to say, oh, well, I'll put in redundant columns to sort of wide format, and I'll end up, you know, limiting them to four, but <laughs> then it doesn't uh, tend to work uh, when, or four or five, and so yeah, you a 20 car accident uh, in the middle of winter in a snowstorm, and suddenly you can't enter all of this information. Anyway, this is just showing if I created it as a date time, I could put the values in there. I could save that. And then in Python, if I read them back, it would come back as a date time. The interesting thing about this is if I read it into R, I get this, but these are offset by six hours. And I think that's because my time zone is central standard time, which is UTC minus six. So it, it may have been better to start off with uh, converting to the arrow file in Python or Pandas. As I said, the reason that I did this in 
in um, Julia's because I know that system better these days. It, had I done it in uh, Python, it would look like this. Uh, there's, of course, many different kinds of CSV file readers in Python. Uh, one of them is based upon the arrow library. So I can say from pi arrow import CSV, set the convert options, which is automatically dictionary and code, and the strings can be null, look at the time values. And then here, if I read it in, I get that description again. When I take the uh, these and I save them, I have those. I have that information, um, and it looks the same as before. The difference here is only the non-missing values are in the dictionary in Python, and the indices include the null values or the missing values. Uh, so I can convert it into a pandas data frame, and then it can be written out um, in this feather format. And if I go into Julia, I'll get, uh, I, I can bring it in as a, uh, an arrow file. One of the things to notice here is that the Python columns are all going to allow for missing data. And also because these names haven't been normalized, it has to do it in kind of an awkward way to write out the names so that they can contain the missing, uh, the, the blanks. And this, this is what the table looks like um, here. Uh, and this is right reading it in R. Again, one of the things to notice is that the date time has been shifted. Uh, it's read in Python as uh, 2021.01.01 and then uh, midnight. And now it's been shifted back so that it's uh, by six hours. So this is all to say that it's effective, but it's not foolproof by any means. Um, okay, uh, let me just do one more. This is the same thing reading it in R. Um, and uh, I want to write it out. And here it's just writing it out as strings. Right? or I can read it in Python and get the information there. So this is the sense in which it's cross-language. And um, all of these uh, little uh, vignettes were created using the Corto system. So a great shout out to the people at uh, Posit for doing that, for creating Corto.pub, I have to tell you, it is incredibly easy to use. So if you're going to be working in the R Markdown, Knitter, Corto environment, you really might want to consider making a, um, making a login on Corto.pub so that you can share ideas. So let me recap a bit. Python and R are very widely used uh, in data science. Julia has a smaller but dedicated following. Um, each of these languages will be demonstrated by an expert in the next section. Each language is supported by thousands of packages. I checked recently and there's currently about 8,500 registered packages in uh, Julia. I believe that there's somewhere between 20 and 30,000 uh, on CRAN for R. And I think it gets into the hundreds of thousands for Python. So lots and lots of packages out there. They provide incredible opportunities, but there's so much to learn and remember. Um, they can be used in the repo. Uh, they can be used through scripts or notebooks. And in particular here, many people may be aware of Jupyter notebooks. 
the name was constructed from Julia, Python, and R. Um, later, uh, Josh Day is going to show you another type of notebook used, uh, Pluto notebook used in Julia. But uh, Jupyter Lab is another editing environment for these. So there's many, many different ways. Again, I'm very enthused about this document uh, creation system called Corto. that can be used across many platforms from laptops to cloud servers to supercomputers. And they can be used in conjunction with version control systems like Git because you're writing source code and even something like Corto, you're writing uh, markdown and source code blocks and so forth. So these are very amenable to version control systems like Git and, and having GitHub and so forth. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is you've got a lot of wonderful facilities and it does take effort to learn how to use these different capabilities uh, capabilities, but it definitely repays that effort. I want to comment a little bit here about the history of these languages. Uh, I would say that R pioneered the idea of open source data analysis. And in the 1990s, open source was still considered kind of iffy. Um, people felt that uh, those of us who were working on the R project were being kind of uh, presumptuous because we weren't professional programmers and uh, we, you know, we were just some academics who were trying to work on a um, programming language and uh, data analysis capabilities. And it sort of ignored the fact that we were the ones who taught the programmers who worked at places like uh, SAS and SPSS and so on. <clears throat> so, um, Oftentimes then our efforts were dismissed as being freeware or as the student edition of something or other. It took a long time for people to trust that open source software that was freely available was high quality. Um, it's not the same now. The expensive commercial uh, systems use proprietary formats. Um, the idea at the time was that you would use a graphical user interface. And I should mention, Eric Raymond uh, wrote a book called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. And this was at the beginning of the open source movement. So he was contrasting the convention in closed source proprietary software, which he said was like the cathedral, the high priests dictated what the masses could do. And um, the bazaar is just everything's sitting out there and you know it's, it's it's a messy noisy but accessible place and that was really the difference between the commercial systems and getting into open source the REPL is very important because you get used to exploration so john chambers who was the person who was the primary architect for the s language which was the parent of r um used to talk about having a gradual uh, evolution where you start off and you're using things as if it was some kind of super calculator in the REPL, and then you find that you're repeating things. So you start to write some scripts or you go into the um, notebooks and then you find, well, maybe I should create some functions here because I'm doing this operation over and over and over again. And then you can start to say, well, I should encapsulate these functions together and some definitions and make it so that they work together, creating a package and so forth. So the whole concept was that you would be able to gradually evolve from your initial use through to, you know, writing packages and contributing to the system overall. And it's a very democratic environment. So. I, I'm, I'm very proud of the work that uh, we did uh, and my small involvement in that because um, it really is a democratizing influence on, on the whole of the data analysis. The problem with the bazaar is it's accessible, 
but it's confusing. And some of the time, it's good to have exposure to more than one way to do an analysis, and that'll be the next section for you. Um, so I'm talking about re-expressing the data tables here. Uh, I think that this is important. We, we like to think that our value added is in the model building and the wonderful visualization techniques, but in the real world, a large part of our time is spent wrangling the data into a usable form. And I, it's possible to do that in a sort of a scripting manner and every time go back to the CSV file or whatever was the origin for the data, read it, transform it, continue on. Um, you should realize that every time that you're dealing with character representations, there's ambiguity and there's expense. You know, it's a lot more expensive to pick up the character representation of numbers and to go through and look at the columns of a CSV file and decide, can these all be represented as integers? And if so, can they be represented as this type of integer or is this a date or, you know, the old jokes about Excel, everything is a date. Um, and that you don't want to have, once you've done that once, I think this is idea of saving it into a binary form with the associated metadata. So I didn't show you saving the metadata, but you can do that. And I think it, again, it's very important to have the provenance. How did I go from the original data to the form that I have here? So, you know, I wanna talk about the Apache Arrow format. We've seen that. Uh, most of the high level language implementations are based on the C++ library. The only two uh, uh, exceptions to that are the Julia package and the package in Rust. Um, the arrow format is very promising. I think it's worthwhile keeping an eye on that. It's not yet foolproof as we've seen with the convention by uh, looking at the um, the, date, the uh, storage of the date time and whether it has a uh, time zone associated with it. Dates and times are the worst. I mean, especially for free format input. If you have people including something like date of birth and they just have the ability to fill in a form, you spend an enormous amount of time trying to reconcile all the different ways that they'll enter it. Um, I mentioned the posit now formerly R Studio is providing this wonderful system, which um, you know the uh, uh, Corto system, and definitely worthwhile taking a look at that. Uh, look at the documentations. I make some, uh, you, you should realize, again, you know, I've been retired for a decade, so I don't make up a lot of presentations every day. And as a result, I'm using just very, very primitive things. I, I finally got around to applying one of the styles. Uh, but you you can see much, much more interesting presentations in the awesome Corto repository or Isabella Velasquez uh, provides much, much better slides so you can get an idea there. Uh, I haven't been involved at all in quarter development. I'm simply a uh, satisfied and grateful user. We're using it for a book that we're writing about mixed effects models uh, in a Julia package for fitting them. We also have some workshops where we created websites using Corto. It's great stuff. Uh, for something like a book, it provides all of the um, special characters, uh, equations, cross-references. It's, it's just magical, the work that they've done on that. Uh, I was going to talk about the, um, the VS Code, but I think I'm just about out of time here. And so, uh, I'll let other people mention what they're going to be using for their integrated development environment and throw it open to uh, discussion and questions at this point.
as everyone, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now, if that's okay. Everyone's left. <laughs> that's okay. Okay. Any question from the audience? You know, you have probably have two devices. It's very, you can hear the echo. There's one question in the chat window. Oh, yes. Yeah. So the question in the chat room is why did I make the switch to Julia? Um, as, as has been mentioned, I've worked on mixed effects models and going uh, and being able to do the fitting rapidly and to be able to use methods for uh, you know, compute intensive methods like bootstrap and profiling for um, inference with those models. I wanted to get high performance. And in R, that ends up meaning that you need to go to compiled code. And you lose a lot in that transformation. You know, I've, I've worked with RCPP. Uh, in fact, I think I'm still listed as part of RCPP core. Again, I haven't been active in that for some time. And uh, Dirk likes to characterize that as seamless integration. Um, there is no seamless integration of a dynamic language and a uh, static, statically typed compiled language. You can't make that seamless. And it's very difficult. So, you know, 2011, I saw people were, uh, I was actually reading about LLBM and I saw mention of this language, Julia. And it fascinated me with uh, predominant because it's based on multiple dispatch. I need to do a lot of numerical linear algebra and multiple dispatch to me is the natural way of looking at uh, numerical linear algebra. And uh, the idea of just-in-time compilation. So uh, it's, it's a very powerful system. And if you look at the uh, Julia packages, almost all of them are 100% in Julia. So this mixed models package that I've been working on for a long time, um, it's 100% Julia. There's no compiled, there's no code written in another language. And that's, and it's also very fast. It outperforms uh, the other systems. I don't know of another language in which that's possible. So that's what, uh, th that's the short answer. I just love the facilities and uh, I like the community. The community is very open, it's very welcoming. The downside, you got to start re-implementing things, but I'm always re-implementing things. So. Uh, and, and I don't have a real job anymore, I'm retired. So I can afford to do that. Uh, next question, how long has Apache been out for and what do you think it will take for it to replace existing software and big data research? Um, Apache Arrow has been around for three, four years now, I think. Um, another system called Parquet has been widely used for large data sets. Uh, I think that Arrow is an upgrade from Parquet and certainly from Feather. What will it take for it to replace? Uh, I'm not a good person to answer that because I'm not involved in day-to-day uh, data science, and so, uh, and and I'm not involved in the commercial end of things. Uh, I know that some of the firms that I have uh, connections with, or some um, 
exchanges with uh, places like Beacon Biosignals. There, they use Arrow format throughout, and you know we we use it in our our work on uh, mixed models and so on. So, I am optimistic, but I am not a good prognosticator of what will uh, work commercially. For someone looking into, um, is it recommended to decide on a statistical program programming language? Uh, I'm probably not the greatest person to answer that. As I said, you know, I've been retired for 10 years now, so I can't give you what's going on up to date. Um, Arrow's been out for about, Uh, I can't read that. Six-ish years. Okay. I was reading it as fish and it didn't make sense. Um, is it parquet that I mentioned? Uh, it's, it's as in the flooring. P-A, uh, let me just write it down here. P-A-Q-U-A-R, parquet, parquet. I think that's what it is. It just, if, if you look it up, it, it's the name of a uh, type of flooring. Can I write it? Oh, it's here. Sorry. Um, okay. Yeah. So there's other answers in there. Anyway, um, I think I've overstayed my welcome. So if the uh, if the organizers want to uh, switch on to the next session, I'd recommend that you do that. I think we still have four four minutes. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's unusual for me. <laughs> All right. Anything more? Um, if I can say one quick thing about. Uh, your switch to Julia. So I remember at uh, JuliaCon, I think 2016, so this was a few years back, you had a lightning talk. Uh, and I remember in that talk, you said your R code uh, took the better part of a day to fit a specific model. And then you, you finished fitting it in Julia in your 10 minute talk at JuliaCon. Uh, so that's, that's something that always sticks out to me. Well, thank you, Josh. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm very, I'm very happy with the work in Julia. Uh, I'm trying to type in the URL where I can download. Oh, okay. Somebody else has done that for me. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, if, if you do want to hear me drone on for another minute or two, uh, why, why did I end up um, using uh, Julia? Uh, one of the real turning points for me is that it's it's built on uh, multiple dispatch, uh, and that's available in R. So if you wonder, in R, there's a package called LMA4 for fitting mixed effects models, and the four referred to the S4 classes and methods. And so um, that was in R, the ability to do multiple dispatch. And there's another package called the matrix package with a capital M. Uh, and we used uh, multiple dispatch in there. At one point, LME4 and matrix were part of the same pack or, you know, in the same package. And then we split matrix out. And the reason is that if you're going to do um, high performance numerical linear algebra, the way that you do it is you specialize and you wanna know what's the left operand, what's the right operand and what's the type of the result. And this is just a natural for multiple dispatch. So I've been working in numerical linear algebra systems and languages like this for many years. Uh, and 
I think that the systems in Julia are head and shoulders above everything else that I've seen. And that's the way that you make a lot of model fitting fast is that you do the linear algebra rapidly. So that's essentially the best, uh, the, the best answer. Um, again, let me emphasize, I'm a retired guy. I can goof off if I want to. Uh, I don't have to actually show up in an office and uh, I'm just doing this for interest. So, uh, you know, if, if I had to do it for real, uh, I might, I, I might go with a, a more uh, common language. Um, multiple dispatch. What I'm trying to say there in multiple dispatch is uh, in R, if you have an S3 method, it means that when you say print uh, an object, it will look at the class of object and it will dispatch, it will go to a particular print method for that object. So that's what's called single dispatch. And you know, object-oriented programming in Python, C++, Java, uh, dispatches on the argument from that owns, whose type owns the method. Uh, sometimes it's called self. Whereas uh, when you get to S4 classes and methods, it looks at the combination of arguments that you've given it. So that's referred to as multiple dispatch, that it dispatch is based upon the classes and types of multiple arguments. Um, and what I'm trying to say is that for a uh, numerical linear algebra, that is a huge win. I mean, it's, it's a huge win in other cases as well. It's very, very difficult to do that effectively. It requires someone with the skills of a Jeff Bizanson to do that. Uh, and in fact, that was Jeff's uh, PhD thesis, <laughs> was figuring out how to do multiple dispatch really, really effectively. Um, so that's the definition of multiple dispatch. Um, I'll, I'll try to respond. Uh, in, in the discussion to some of these other questions. Right now, I think that you should hear from younger and more knowledgeable folks than I. So thank you for your attention.